Hi, I'm Shannon Emmons with the Garland County Library. Welcome to our author talk with author Carl Ford Jr. Um, before we get started, I've got a few um, sort of upcoming events I wanted to highlight for us. Um, tomorrow night, the Saline County Library is hosting author Ashlyn Ohm. Her book is When the Ice Melts, and that's going to be at 7 p.m. And we'll be sharing that through um, these same social media outlets where you're accessing tonight's broadcast. And then next uh, week on July the 5th, also at 6, oh, excuse me, at 6 o'clock, we're going to um, also share Celine County Library's uh, broadcast with author Wanda Brunstetter. And she is an Amish romance writer with more book titles out than I could even hope to list for you uh, tonight. So um, again, that'll be July 5th at 6 o'clock. And then at the end of next month, um, on July 28th at 6 o'clock, um, the Have Book, Will Travel Book Club is going to be participating in the program If All Arkansas Read the Same Book. And so the book that's going to be featured in that initiative this year is uh, The Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. Um, and that broadcast, um, again, it's at six. There'll be a discussion between sort of the local Garland County members of the Have Book, Will Travel Book Club, and then they will join um, a larger uh, discussion that's going to include the author herself. So that's pretty exciting. You don't want to miss that. Um, if you'd like details about any of these programs, you can find them on our website at gclibrary.com. Um, so now I want to turn to tonight's program, which is uh, with author Carl Ford Jr. And his book is called Tilting at Windmills, My Tug of War Between Intelligence and Policy. Um, and this copy of the book is actually going to be available through the library in a couple of months. It's got to get through our, our process to go onto the shelves, but you can um, go ahead if you're interested and put it on hold on our website. Um, and then also, if you just can't wait that long or you want your own copy, which I can totally understand, you can find it on Amazon. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Ford. Hello, sir. How are you tonight? I I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and speak with us about your book. Well, it's it's my pleasure. Thank you. So before we really dig in, I wanted to ask you about the cover. I know you've got an interesting story, both about the title and then about the illustration on the front. I'm going to hold that closer so viewers can hopefully get a good look at it. When I retired from the Department of State Bureau of Intelligence and Research, uh, there was a party. And the people had gifts and, and cards and various things. Well, one of my analysts in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research turned out to be an artist. And he presented me with this picture of uh, me dressed up uh, like Don Quixote. And uh, the notion is that, that INR is the smallest of the uh, all source intelligence agencies, CIA and Central Intelligence Agency and Defense Intelligence Agency yes. are much larger. Uh, but uh, State Department, INR, uh, plays above its weight. And we we do that by footnoting things and saying we disagree with the, with the big guys. And so there were a number of issues like uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq uh, and various other issues in which uh, I had gone out on a limb and footnoted and had been uh, fighting against the, the wind, so so to speak. And so I got sort of the rep reputation of tilting at these windmills, even if I, I, I didn't succeed. And so that's that's where it came from. And I, I was very proud of this painting I have. And I said, well, I'll put that on the front of the book. It's lovely. Well, and I love the perspective, I mean, of coming at this almost as an underdog, but you were actually in the room with some some names that any of us would recognize. I'm, I'm reading off the back of the book, um, Senator John Glenn, Joe Biden, Claiborne Pell, Frank Church, Colin Powell, Dick Cheney, Rich Armitage, Paul Wolfowitz, Harry Rowan, William Casey, and George Tenet. I mean, these are some of the biggest names in politics over the last several decades. And um, these were 
people that you were in the room with while they're making decisions. Well, so I, I guess I, I have to admit that, that my mentor for much of this was my time with Senator John Glenn, the astronaut from Ohio. And uh, it was almost a relationship like a, uh, he was like a, an uncle. Uh, and I didn't feel always like I was an employee. Uh, his wife, his families sort of brought in the staff and we were one big family. Uh, and, and so I learned a lot from him and he would take me wherever he went. And being the astronaut uh, and a senator, he got to see a lot of people. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, in China, for example, uh, uh, Menachem Begin uh, in his home in 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 Israel, wow. um, and uh, also uh, King Hussein of Jordan. In fact, my favorite story of John Glenn is uh, he he was invited by uh, the king to come visit Jordan and have lunch with him at some point. The pres President Carter had asked Senator Glenn to give a tour of the Space and Science Museum uh, in Washington to the King when he was there. And they're both pilots. And so they started flying with their hands and they became friends. And it just so happened that Glenn's children had grown up uh, with King Hussein's wife, uh, who was American. Her, fa her father, I think, was American Airlines or something. I'm not sure which airline it was, but uh, so uh, there was a connection there. So we were in Israel and we drove up from uh, Tel Aviv uh, to Jordan, to Amman. And just as we got out of the car, uh, Prince uh, Queen Noor came running down the back stairs, hugged Senator Glenn and said, listen, you know, this is the Middle East. I'm not going to be able to be at the lunch, but I just wanted to tell you how much I was happy that you're here. And she ran back up. Well, just as she ran away, the king and about, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 people came out to meet us. And I, I immediately started thinking of them as the, the bees, because the king would move one foot and everybody else would move the same way. I mean, it was... It was like they were attached to him in some fashion. Uh, and so we went into uh, this summer palace, uh, which was like a very nice uh, house in, in uh, Fort Worth or Dallas. I mean, it wasn't, it, it wasn't one of these uh, rocky uh, palaces that people think of. So we, we went in, and just as we got there, uh, the, the king said, listen, Senator, I just got a call from that I have to take and I'll be right back. Go ahead and sit down at this table fit for a king, of course. And we thought that there would be some of the bees that would stay with us, but no, all of them left with the king. So it was just the senator and I. And the, the, the working class boy from Arkansas is looking at this table and I'm looking at this solid gold goblet on the table going, I wonder if I could get that in my uh, briefcase. And, and all of a sudden I heard, oh, oh. I looked to my left and the senator, astronaut, famous celebrity had taken a solid gold plate and put it down her pants. And I went, oh, boss. <laughs> You get that back on the table. And he just smiled and laughed and put about it on the table. But the instant it sit, sat on the table, all the bees and the, and the king came back. Oh, <laughs> we, my. We missed an international incident by about that much. It was a, But that was one of my fun stories about Glenn. He was a great guy, great sense of humor, great American. Uh, I worked for him for almost six years. I learned a lot from him. I also met a lot of people that – helped me later on as I began moving away from Glenn and into my own career. Well, let me let me take you sort of back in time and 
sort of your first foray into government and take you to your um, enlistment in the military when, when you first became part of the United States government there? Well, I, I had had two years of college and I decided that uh, I didn't have, I'd run out of money. I'd run out of, I'd thumb through the, the, the catalog so many times looking for majors that there weren't any others that I, I hadn't thought of. And I said, well, this is a waste of time. I'm working several hot jobs. I'm going to uh, quit school and go into the military. Uh, and so I came home and, and I told my, my parents and they thought, they thought I was joking. Um, and it was like, you know, I, I'm going to join the military. And they were, okay, pass the chicken. It, it, it just didn't dawn on them that I was really serious. So the next day I set out and went to the Marine recruiting, recruiting office. For some reason, I had wanted to be a Marine. And I got there, and he wasn't there. Uh, and there was a sign saying he was off somewhere and wouldn't be there for three or four hours. And I said well, to myself, <laughs> young man, eager to go do something. I said, well, I can't wait that long. So I walked next door, and there was the Army recruiter. Uh, and he, <laughs> he said to me, listen, we would love to talk to you about this. And we have all these different opportunities, foreign languages and, and medical and, and missiles and stuff. I said, well, what I really want is light weapons infantry training after basic. And he said, well, like I said, we, we could send you to Germany or we could send you to Korea. There are a lot of different places. We could send you to language school. And I said, about the third time, I said, no, I'm interested in light weapons infantry training. He physically took me bodily into a back room. Uh, there was a, a curtain that we went through, and then there were a bunch of boxes and stuff. And he said, do you really want to go into the infantry? And I said, yeah, that's what I want. And he said, okay, I promise you that that's what you'll get. So the next day, I'm, I've gone from Hot Springs to Little Rock. I've already raised my hand. I've become a soldier in the United States Army. And there's this grizzled old sergeant that came into the room and he said, OK, gentlemen, if the Army promised you something, it's going to be on your piece of paper. If it's not there, you don't get it. And so I, I felt I felt great. I, I, I had promised. The Army recruiter in Hot Springs had promised me that I was going to the infantry. And so I looked on my piece of paper and there was nothing there. And I went, oh my God, I'm not going to get it. So I started raising my arm. Going, oh, me. <laughs> and finally, so, what, what, is it? what is it, soldier? And I said, listen, I, it, my promise is, I, he said, I don't hear it. I told you before. If it's not on your piece of paper, you don't get it. So, but I didn't give up. I about the third time I raised my hand and sort of please come over. He finally walked over to me and he said, Okay, soldier, let me see your piece of paper. And he almost ripped it out of my hands. And he looked at it and he said, Well, there's nothing on here. I said, That's the problem. That they <laughs> promised me things in hot spring. Oh, oh, oh. They promised you stuff. What did they promise you? I said, They promised me I would get light weapons infantry training. He looked at me and he stood back and he said, son, in your case, I'm going to make an exception. And he took a black mag magic marker out of his pocket and went, <laughs> and with light weapons infantry training. Uh, many years later, I found that piece of paper in all my files. And I went, was I ever that naive that, <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I wasn't going to go into the infantry if that's what I wanted? But in any event, I went into the infantry uh, as an enlisted man. It was the time of the of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh my! And, and it's the only time in the army. Uh, I spent a total of about ten years in the army uh, during two two different tours. But it was the only time I ever had occasion when I walked into the barracks and they had moved live ammunition in boxes in between all of our barracks, our, our bunks, our, our rifles were still locked up, 
but we were getting ready to go to Cuba. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I said, Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? I didn't, I, when I said light weapons infantry training, I didn't mean we we're going to go to Cuba, <laughs> right. but in any event that, that didn't work out. I, I ended up going to infantry officer, officer candidate school, okay. uh, enjoyed it, became an officer, uh, and it changed my life forever. Uh, I was also uh, fortunate during this period of time to, uh, I, I had gone to school at Florida State for a couple of years. Okay. My aunt and uncle lived in Tallahassee and they had uh, legally adopted me <laughs> so that I wouldn't have to pay out of state tuition. Okay. And I could stay with them and so I had room and board. All I had to do was tuition and books and I could kind of do that with the odd jobs that I had. My mom and dad didn't have a lot of money and sure. uh, and so they couldn't help all that much. But my aunt and uncle were really stood up for me. And uh, but after two years, I, I, I don't know what I wanted to do. So I left. Uh, I had one of the odd jobs I'd had while I was there uh, was I was the dishwasher at my wife's sorority. Kappa Alpha Theta. That's a plug in for her sorority. By the way. <laughs> and, and so uh, it, it was a job. It paid me like $25 a month plus two meals a day. Wow. I, I, took, uh, I, I had dinner every night, five days a week. So that, that was a great job for me. I loved it. But it also was unbeknownst to me, my first opportunity as an intelligence officer, because there was this tiny little window uh, from where I was a dishwasher and all those beautiful young girls who are having din uh, dinner at, at, at the sorority. And I couldn't go outside. Uh, occasionally I could go out and pick up dirty dishes and bring them back in. But uh, only the servers actually got to mill around and meet with the, the, the girls. But I had, uh, if you're going to recruit an agent, there are two basic things you have to have first. You have to spot that person and say, this is somebody that might be able to help me. Uh, and then you have to assess whether or not uh, they will be of use and if they have something to contribute. And then you recruit them. Okay. Well, I, I looked through that window and I found a girl out there <laughs> that was, in my mind, worth recruiting. And so uh, we had our ups and downs for a while, but uh, 58 years later, uh, I'm still married to uh, my, the girl I spotted and assessed at Florida State uh, through that little window. And I still have the cleanest hands because uh, <laughs> uh, I, I do the dinner dishes. And so, so uh, that was how uh, I met my wife. Uh, she helped me during these early years, we went in the army together. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to go to Vietnam. And uh, I called the recruit, the infantry officer branch and said, listen, I, I'm interested in going to, to Vietnam. Okay. And they kind of laughed at me. And so, oh, no, you're a reserve officer. Uh, we're only taking West Pointers and, and high flyers. You're, no, no, don't. Would you like to go to Korea? <laughs> I said, no. I could explain to my wife why I'm going to Vietnam, but I couldn't explain uh, about Korea. Well, this was early in the war. About three or four months later in December, I get a telephone call from the same guy who had laughed at me. Oh. And he said, do you want to go to Vietnam? You still want to go to Vietnam? I said, yeah. And he said, okay, when when could you be in California? And I said, well, when this was like a Wednesday. He said, could you make it by Friday? Friday. <laughs> That's right. I, and he said, I will I will make I will make sure that the orders reach you in California. Uh, and but all along the way, the orders were all messed up. And 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 in any event, I spent the first tour. Uh, at MACV uh, in Saigon, uh, and uh, it was an uneventful uh, tour. Uh, but 
I, my wife and I talked about, listen, listen, with two years of college, I'm not going anywhere in the army. Mm -hmm. So I got out and went back to Florida state. Okay. I got a, a, a bachelor's degree in East Asian or Asian studies and MA in East Asian studies. And my wife, uh, taught school to help support us. Plus I had the GI Bill of Rights and my only job was to watch, uh, I can't remember the name of the soap opera, uh, but I had to watch the soap opera each day because my wife was in a carpool with other teachers and they wanted to be kept up with what <laughs> was going on in the soap opera. So I had, I had, had that responsibility, but I did real well when I came back. I, I really enjoyed what I was doing. I took Chinese mm -hmm. language, uh, did well at that. And so I decided, well, I'll go back in the army. Okay. And at that point, I'd been an infantry officer. I said, there's got to be a better way to make a living uh, than getting shot at. So I, why don't I go back as a military intelligence officer? So I asked for a branch transfer and got it. And uh, I signed up for what I thought was an analytical job. Okay. It was called area intelligence. And I get to Fort Holabird, Maryland, and about the first day, I realized that area intelligence meant you were a spy. <laughs> oh, my. So you're an accidental spy. They were, they were training me to recruit spies to work for the United States. Wow. And I went, ooh. <laughs> I, I didn't know this was what it was going to be, but I found it to be fascinating and interesting uh, and uh there were all kinds of crazy episodes. I was, I don't know if you were, you're too young, but there was, it used to be a TV show called Maxwell, Maxwell Smart. Oh, yes, yes. Who <laughs> always did everything wrong. Well, I was the Max, Max, Maxwell Smart of the intelligence school at that particular time. Okay. Uh, for instance, I, one of the things we had to do was we had to uh, operate inside uh, Baltimore. Okay. And I, you had to have some cover. You had to have some reason for being where you were. All right. And, uh, well, I take it back. It wasn't bold. I actually had gone to Providence, Rhode Island to recruit an agent. Okay. And my first big assignment. And I get there and I put my, uh, I was going to put my bag in the YMCA. So if I got stopped by the police or the FBI who were alerted, and of course the students were coming, and they were looking for us, that I could I could point to the fact, no, I'm here. My bag is up here at the Y if you want to see. And so I went up to the Y, I brought my bag, and he said, okay, here, fill out that form. I filled out the form and I misspelled my cover name. <laughs> Oh no! And, and so I said, I "Could I have another one?" <laughs> this time, I got nervous. I wrote my own name. Oh I, no! Oh no! No, that won't work. The third time, I asked the 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 person at the Y for another form. He said, "Okay, this is the last one you get. Don't mess it up." <laughs> so I put my cover name, got it spelled right. And uh, in fact, it it it, it helped me uh, get through the process. But I was Maxwell Smart. Uh, but the first tour out of Fort Holliburg was going back to Vietnam, and I went to uh, Port Adena in Saigon uh, for the five uh, two five two five MI group, and then I was sent up to Nha Trang the second battalion. And then they sent me up to central highlands, a little small town called Bami to uh, it. was famous for its logging enterprises okay. it was up, up in the woods and barely a favorite place of the former emperor of, of Vietnam. And there were still wild animals in the, in the woods. Uh, but it was, it was a, a place where I got started. And my job was to recruit people who would go into Cambodia uh, from Vietnam and 
collect information, and particularly along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Oh, wow. And uh, the, the, they gave me one guy that had been recruited by somebody else, and he was able to give me the first uh, recruitment of a person that was to be the sort of key to my operation. <laughs> and uh, they, the lights went out in here, and it's changed. I'm not sure. Oh, no. Well, you keep talking. I will come fix your lights. Uh, but in any event, uh, this guy that I recruited, uh, I, I, I had to send everything because it was third country, Vietnam to Cambodia. I had to send everything to CIA to get approved. And you would ask these, they would ask these silly questions. What year were you born? And I would ask the guy, and he said, well, that was the year the pig died. I said, I'd write that down. And I'd say, well, what street did you live on? He said, well, I didn't live on the street. I lived out in the, I lived out in the, in, in the woods, in, in the jungle. And uh, so I uh, uh, asked him, I said, okay, how old are you? He said, well, I don't know. I'm older than my brother. Uh, he was born before I was. That was the year uh, that the storm knocked the house down. And so all of this crazy information went on this form. And uh, I just, just out of, I guess, pure meanness. I, I wrote into the form his cover name, uh, his acronym, and I named him Numb Nuts, just with the idea of having people back in Langley and CIA just go crazy. You can't do that. Well, they, they let me. And so this guy, who was the key to uh, my recruitment efforts uh, was for, for then and forever known as Numb Nuts. But he, he was very good. Uh, he was actually an, uh, an elephant driver. <laughs> wow. And he would travel uh, into uh, Cambodia cutting wood. And I had to get special permission because he wanted to bring his cutters with him. And so they go, oh, no, we can't use teams. I said, well, yeah, we can. Because if you cross the Vietnamese border into Cambodia alone, it's immediately assumed that you, that you are a spy and they're going to kill you. Sure. So my guys, sure. uh, we put together this team and we began to collect quite a bit of information. Now, it wasn't the thing that the president would see. It mm -hmm. wasn't earth shaky. But in fact, a program that had been dormant for several years, we got going. Uh, we finally... Uh, I was able to have so many recruitments that I needed to, they sent me a young lieutenant. Uh, and uh, my young lieutenant uh, came to me the first day and said, uh, sir, uh, I don't want to die. Oh. <laughs> and I'm going, well, you know, I, all, none of us really want to do that. Right. He said, no, no, you don't understand. I really don't want to die. And so, again, my meanness came out. And I said, well, you know, you have to have special duties while you're here. And one of your duties is if uh, there is an attack on the compound, I want you to get up on the roof with the M60 machine gun. Ah, you know, <laughs> your eyes got huge. And so for the next several days, I would find him awake or sleeping in the, in the sort of living area with a machine gun in his lap, waiting to be told to run up on the roof uh, uh, to protect us. So finally, I, I got so tired of having this guy around, I decided I would send him down to the Cambodian border. And I arranged to have him uh, on a, uh, he, he would be staying with a special forces base camp. And again, my meanness came out. And on the way down, I arranged uh, that as soon as the pilot let the the firebase know that we were on our we were closed, 
that they would start firing off all of their their weapons and there would be smoke and 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 uh, so I wow as we got close uh, the, the signal went out and it looked like the whole world had blown up in front of us and the pilot turned around to us and said hot LZ hot LZ <laughs> and so we landed in the smoke. Uh, my young Lieutenant Lemon, who I'd begun to call him Lemon. Uh, was that because you were dissatisfied with him? Or? He accepted that. I, he, in fact, he started signing his reports, drawing a lemon. Um, and, and so uh, he wouldn't get out. Uh, we threw his gear out. He grabbed a hold of the, 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 the chair attached in the, uh, or the seats in the, in the helicopter and we'll get out. Finally, we got him out and we flew off and I could see him yelling, come back, come back. Oh. Uh, uh, but uh, he lasted there about uh, a month. Okay. And then he went from, he didn't come back to me. He went to the battalion. He stayed there about two weeks and then they sent him back to Saigon. And eventually they said, we don't even need this guy here. They sent him home. So I don't know. I think he probably only had two or three months in Vietnam. Uh, but Lemon was one of my first experiences with somebody who didn't want to die. <laughs> and, uh, it was always one of those things that uh, nobody wants to do that. You go there because it's your duty uh, and there are risks involved, but you just... That's what soldiers do. So, in any you, event, uh, you're after, calling this your meanness, but also like your life depends on his, and other people's lives would depend on you know. And so you've got to make sure of the person who's next to you. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, what happened is that when I left Vietnam, uh, I didn't know where I was going to go, uh, and they said, "Well, you're going to the Defense Intelligence Agency. Show up." And it's like they're throwing me in to the briar patch. I, it was the it was the ideal assignment that I had been looking for forever. An analytical job. I was going to be an analyst on my specialty, which had been the Chinese military, and so I was responsible um, with a group of about eight or ten other analysts at looking at the Chinese army, and. Uh, there was this lady there, Eda, Eda, Eva Watkins, who had been following the Chinese military since World War II when they were fighting the Japanese. And she was the person who I worked for, uh, all of the analysts worked for, and she was quite a taskmaster. But I learned how to be an analyst, what, it, what it, the details that were required from her. She was really just uh, a national treasure. Uh, and uh, I I can never uh, thank her enough for getting me started on the right road uh, when it comes to comes to intelligence. Um, I feel like I should mention briefly that we've blown our cover here. When the lights went out, I had to take away your opulent living room in the back. Well, well, so. This one looks more like my living room anyway. Yeah, it's sort of a blank green. But uh, no, uh, after I was there at the De Defense Intelligence Agency. Okay. And one of the things that we were in constant conflict with was the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay. Uh, they didn't like some of the stuff we were doing. And uh, we were always constantly battling each other over this issue or that issue. We had one view, they had another. And I've been there about four years and I got a call uh, from CIA. And they said, would you like to come to work to, for us? I, I was uh, an army captain. I had just gotten my regular army commission and mm -hmm. loved the army. Uh, had never thought about it changing and, and staying in Washington, working for CIA. But my wife had a great job in the District of Columbia uh, at, a, at a school that she taught at. She later was a principal there for 20 years. Uh, 
Wow. Um, but she, she said, Carl, I kind of like to stay. <laughs> and so uh, I think because I was a burr under their saddle, uh, they asked me to come uh, work for CIA, leave the Army, join CIA, uh, and become an analyst on the People's Liberation Army, not just the Army, but the Air Force, the Navy, uh, missiles, and the Army. So I reluctantly, uh, with a certain uh, fear and concern, I, I left my commission, became a civilian analyst at CIA. And I, my, the first project that I worked on uh, I, I thought I'd done an excellent job. And I turned it in. And a couple of days later, I got it back. And with red magic marker, oh, no. my branch chief had written, flawed beyond repair. Oh, my. My first assignment, and I left the Army. I was stuck in this place, and I had done a report that was flawed beyond repair. Well, I, I didn't take that for, for the final answer. I actually went to my division chief, and I said, uh, listen, boss, I, I have done this paper, and here is my research. Uh, and my branch chief has simply said it's flawed beyond repair. He said, well, let's get together. And he said, branch chief, come over. Carl, you come over. We'll sit down and you give your pitch. Uh, he can give his pitch. So at the end of this pitch, my division chief looked at me and said, well, this is good. We're, we're going to publish this. And so uh, it got published. Uh, and my branch chief made the mistake of going over the head of the division chief and went to the office director, not knowing that the secretary in the office director's office and the secretary in the division chief's office were at lunch together all the time oh, and were yeah. good friends. And she called and she said, why is Paul up here asking to see the director? Uh, and she said, I don't know. The, the division chief doesn't know anything about it. So he went up there confronted him. Uh, he was moved off to a job somewhere else in the agency. He never got another promotion. Uh, but but one, uh, it was the first victory I had at CIA. But also it was the point that a senior analyst, someone uh, can take, and he had written the paper that I was criticizing. Uh, and so he didn't want me to write this paper that said, by the way, he's wrong and I'm right. And, uh, uh, but he went beyond what you should ever do. And that is have a senior analyst push back on a young analyst just because it doesn't fit with what you're believing. So I had a, I had a excellent fun career at CIA. It was the kind of place where I could go in and I'd say, okay, here's an idea I have. And here is how I would go about solving that, answering this question. Uh, but it's going to take me six months to do it. Uh, okay. Chief, division chief, can I do it? And I'd say, okay. And so I could spend the next six months working on this project, trying to come up with uh new knowledge or, or a better answer to the conventional wisdom. And uh, that kind of work uh, is, is the sort of work that I always use the example of the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. Uh, nobody, uh, only person who ever reads that is uh, Dr. Gupta of CNN. And, and he explains to people that don't know anything about medicine, what the latest developments are. Uh, but I'd make a wager, for example, that Dr. Gupta is never going to discover a cure for brain cancer, although he's a brain surgeon. That's not his job. 
Okay. His job was to take and report what the for non experts what was being said in the medical community. Well, that's what research analysts do in the intelligence community or in colleges in the history and political science or whatever. Uh, they're creating new knowledge that can be used by others uh, to make uh, help improve uh, the, the information that goes to the president. The president wouldn't want to read most of my research studies, but what it contained had truths in it that would, in fact, impact the way people brief the president on various issues. So, so go uh, back, go back. You said analysts create new knowledge. How does that process work? Well, it, it's uh, most intelligence, and in fact, today, all intelligence is what I call current reporting. Okay. Uh, that is that there's an event that occurs, and a very smart, capable people uh, in the intelligence community, they're as good or better than when I was an analyst. They'll take this event, uh, put it together with what they kind of remember about this issue uh, that they've thought of for a while. They give their, they give the event their opinion and it goes into the president's daily brief. Okay. Um, the, this uh, directed research, which I was doing at CIA, is actually, doesn't start with an event. Okay. It starts with a question. Did this happen? And if so, why did it happen? So that you have to then put together a research design and say, okay, if, if I, that's an important question that needs to be answered, how do I take all of this material that's coming in and just like a tsunami into the intelligence community each day, how can I use that to try to help answer this question? And do, by doing that, I increase the amount of understanding. I call it new knowledge. I see. Uh, understanding of a problem. Uh, and that in the past, when people like me were doing this sort of research, uh, the current reporters uh, would take what had happened last night, uh, their own knowledge of this issue, and they would remember, oh, by the way, Ford wrote about something very similar to this six months ago. And they would bring some of that material uh, as uh, in-depth uh, knowledge to add to their current opinions. Okay. Uh, and so that the overall product was made better by having people having answered questions rather than constantly responding to events. Like most current reporters are forced to operate every day. Oh, something new happened. I got to write it down. I got to, I got to try to get it in the president's daily brief. Uh, this is, I, I got to move fast. Well, as I tried to suggest, a researcher doesn't move fast. They move at the pace it requires to answer the question. And uh, the more recent current event to make this point uh, is that we have been very good about providing the Ukraine, Ukrainians uh, information about where tanks were or where artillery were, where they we could give them an, a current report about what was happening uh, in Ukraine. But when asked prior to the invasion, uh, I know Senator King, uh, Senator from uh, from Maine, asked the DNI, why was I told prior to the war that one, the Russians would take Kiev in three days and that the uh, Ukrainians wouldn't put up a fight? And the DNI tried to explain, well, he says, stop, you were wrong. What I want to know is why were you so wrong? Uh, and 
the answer is, is that no one had really asked the question, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the Russian military? If anybody had asked that question in the six months or year before, when this event occurred, people would say, you know, one of their major problems is that they don't have a solid, experienced, non-commissioned officer corps, the sergeants that run every army in the world. I mean, they, they have officers and you have enlisted people or, or soldiers. The people who really run the army are the sergeants. And they've been there, done that. They train the young people and keep the young lieutenants from getting into too much trouble. And so the American Army is very, very uh, lucky to have such a strong uh, corps of sergeants in the Marine Corps, the Army, uh, the equivalents of the Navy and the Air Force. Well, the Russians don't. And if we, if they had known that, it would have made a difference in how they just, if they knew some of the weaknesses, it would have been a different call. I see. Uh, they got the current part uh, uh, that they made their current report based on what they were seeing. Tanks, too many tanks, too many ABCs. Russians are bigger, stronger. Uh, what they didn't do, however, was that INR, my old agency, uh, has a unique capability of doing public opinion polling. Now, it doesn't do the polling itself. What it does is it writes the question, and then it goes to ask a Frenchman or a Ukrainian or a German, somebody, somebody who could get into the country that you're interested in, and, and take an opinion poll. Well, they had done that in the Ukraine. And the Ukrainians, the answer back from the Ukrainians is that we're going to fight to the last man. And that was reported. But again, the big guys just sort of brush, brushed off little line R and said, well, you guys don't know what you're talking about. But they did. If they had added that to the knowledge that the, there were certain weaknesses in the Russian military, Senator King and the president would have gotten much different answers to the questions of what's going to happen. Uh, are the Russians going to invade and how successful they will be without research, without people digging down into the weeds, you can't answer those kinds of questions. You can't answer what the weaknesses are unless you study that for some length of time or what the strengths are. So, uh, at some point in the past, uh, it was 20, 25 years ago, at least, uh, as a response to the ending of the Cold War, the war on terror coming up, uh, cuts in the budget, they decided that they would just simply do away with research. As strange as that may seem, <laughs> as, as, uh, as drastic as that may seem. When I was at CIA, there was an office of political research. And the people there, I, I was doing China. So the China people in, in Office of Political Research were world class. People from Stanford and London and wherever would come and talk to these people because they were the experts. There was also an office of economic research. Okay. And there was a guy that, named Mike Field who was the number one China economist in the world, bar none. There was also, also an office of missiles and space that went into the same sort of research in those sorts of areas. And there was an office of strategic research, OSR. Uh, that's the, the group that I belong to. And it was mostly Soviet Union, but there was a, a seven or eight of us doing China. Okay. Uh, and finally, there was a fifth office, which was the Office of Current Reports, Current Intelligence, OCI. At some point, they decided to get rid of political research, economic research, military research, missiles and space research. And the only survivor was this one office 
the Office of Current Intelligence. And it, it sort of grew in size. And about the same time, they reoriented the organization from sort of military, economic, and political. They said, let's do it geographically. So there was an office that looked at East Asia. There was an office that looked at Russia and and, and uh, former Soviet Union, uh, South America, whatever. But it was geographically oriented. But it was all current reporting. Nobody was doing any research. Uh, it's why when people ask me, uh, I'll tell them, I think that the intelligence community is broke. It's broken. Without having a solid research effort, we're going to be wrong more times than not when we advise the president about some current issue, whether it's about China, North Korea, Russia, Iran, whatever it might be. Uh, you don't need to follow in great detail every country in the world. That that's that's not feasible. We don't have enough people. But you can you can do Russia, you can do China, you can do North Korea, and you can do Iran, and you can do those in about the same level of detail that we used to put on the Soviet Union. Uh, that is, that for every current reporter, you need at least four or five research analysts working on coming up, going through all this mass of data and coming up with better answers to the questions that policymakers have, uh, or they don't even know what to ask, but we answer it for them. Uh, and until the intelligence community reorients itself and says, you know, current reporting without research is just simply, uh, it's an apple pie with a crust, but no apples in it. Uh, it, it really, you, you can't do a good job at intelligence uh, without having uh, done this basic work. Now, the I, used, I started off on order of battle information, which is very basic. It's a basic intelligence. Uh, uh, CIA, I was doing directed, but basic research, uh, for example, has also disappeared. It used to be that DIA and CIA, DIA particularly, did an order of battle on on China. Uh, at some point in, in time, they decided that they didn't want to do it anymore, uh, and they asked what was then called SYNCPAC, the uh, commander of the Pacific Forces in Hawaii. Well, you do it. So they sent that responsibility to Hawaii. Okay. Uh, a few years later, I heard that the, the people at SYNCPAC gave it to the reserves. <laughs> so that uh, the basic tool, order battle and table of organization equipment, basic research, if you don't have those, you can't do military capabilities analysis. You can't answer the questions, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the Russian military? Just It's just not possible. You can make wild guesses, but without those basic intelligence tools, uh, you just simply can't get anywhere. Those basic tools also, if done properly, allow you to manipulate these large national databases. Uh, for example, one of our major sources of military intelligence comes from imagery, okay. satellites and various other things. And there are people whose sole job is to look at all of this imagery and read out uh, what's seen at a particular installation or a particular place. Well, when I was at CIA, a couple of my friends discovered that in that database, which was just chock full of great information, there were 17 different ways to say type 15, type 59 tank. Oh. 
And so that if you went in and asked the database for type 59 tanks, you only got one, not all 17. And so it, it, it would give you a distorted picture. Well, what they did was they wrote a dictionary and it said, okay, uh, they spent a lot of time going through all the database and saying, okay, these are the 17 ways that the tank is taught. This is the way uh, they went through every piece of equipment and and said, okay, this is all the same thing. If if you see this, it means this as well. So when you ask for tanks, you got all of them, uh, and not just a few of them. And they then wrote a little basic, it was all a little basic program. And it said, if uh, something new comes in that doesn't fit into any of these categories, pop it out and we'll, we'll add it to something or we'll add a new category. So it was a great uh, little program. Uh, they'd gone to the national database and they'd said, well, we don't, it, it's fine. It was for the people, uh, imagery analysts who were using it, but not for the analysts who were trying to get data out. Uh, they went to the local CIA, IBM folks, and they said, ah, nah, no problem. So these two guys with a basic elementary level of basic programming wrote this dictionary. And, for example, I did a study. Uh, there was a reporting throughout the intelligence community that the Chinese army was moving from truck mobile to armored personnel carriers, okay. which would mean an increase in capabilities, considerable, uh, particularly since the Russians, the Soviet Union at the time had everything mechanized. Uh, and in fact, there were armored personnel carriers being seen all over China. And I said, okay, well, let's look into that. Let's, let's find out more about that. And I used this dictionary and an update, up-to-date order of battle, one that had been put together by CIA, DIA, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And so it, it was the best we'd ever had an order of battle. And I said, okay, let's put these two things together. Well, there were a lot of APCs. I couldn't find a single APC at an infantry unit. They were at headquarters. Uh, the, the commander always gets something fancy first. Uh, they were at scout units uh, where you might expect them to be. And there were some at armored units. Okay. Not a single infantry unit. So that while it was possible that they were moving in that direction until you started seeing large numbers of APCs, armored personal carriers, at infantry units talking about mechanizing their army was simply wrong. It was a guesstimate. Now, again, did it, did it, it make the whole difference and make a great difference in anything? No, but it certainly change the current reporters had already told the president they're mechanizing well they had to go back and say well, well maybe not <laughs> or certainly not as rapidly as we thought so those were the sorts of things that research could do to check on the conventional wisdom to say well, it sounds okay but is it really if, if if it's true there's going to be a lot of evidence to back it up let's go find it uh, but that, that, that in fact was, uh, uh, a, a, a case in which, uh, they were just flat wrong. Uh, another, another thing that we did at that point in time that would have helped about strengths and weaknesses of the Russian army, we did a, uh, uh, tabletop game uh, simulation okay. of a Russian attack into China. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, a computerized, 
high tech sort of, it was like a board game. Uh, and like Normandy or one of these other games. And we weren't trying to decide who would win or lose a battle. What we were trying to do was see if there was an intelligence, some analysis uh, that we would get by role playing, finding out what the strengths and weaknesses were. Just happened we had just brought to our new China office a Russian specialist, a Soviet uh, military logistics specialist. Uh, in fact, the, the rumor mill had it that he had left uh, Soviet Union and been sent to China down there uh, because he couldn't write very well. Um, oh, there go our lights again. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, oh, give me back. And so... Uh, turn to find out, I found a lot of times in CIA that people who could write well but didn't have anything important to say <laughs> often got promoted over the people who were true experts but had to struggle a little bit at doing the writing part. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the outcome of the game uh, was all of a sudden we realized that the Russians were going to have, the, the conventional wisdom, wisdom was that the Russians would just crush the Chinese. And that unless they could bring the whole nation, the people's war notion into effect, the, the Russians would just run rush, roughshod over the Chinese. And I thought that was a little bit exaggerated. And my friend who was doing the Soviet Union thought the same way. So we said, we'll play this game. Turned out that what happened was that unlike NATO, where most of the Soviet doctrine was based on, uh, their approach there was to break through uh, the one strong uh, defensive position and then exploit throughout the NATO region. Well, in China, they had a different notion. They said, we'll have defense in depth. Uh, and in most places near the border, they would have like four different sets of fortifications where there would be troops ready to fight. Okay. And so when the, the Russians attacked, the Soviets attacked, uh, they cut through the first, first day, they were through the first uh, defensive positions. And by the second night, they were already... Uh, had eaten up the second defensive line. Uh, but they started to slow down at the third line because one, two things were happening. One, they realized they were using far more ammunition, gas, and water than they had if they had been fighting in Europe. Uh, and so that they were running low on all of these key logistic issues. Well, <laughs> beyond that, they also found that the troops that had been broken through didn't just go home. Uh, <laughs> they stayed and started blowing up uh, uh, gas tanks, ammunition trucks, uh, destroy, trying to destroy the resupply effort. And so by the time they got to the fourth defensive position where the Chinese were in their strongest, some of their main forces were mm -hmm. finally in, in combat, they were already out of gas. They were going to have to halt and go back and get more from Mother Russia. Now, they, of course, had, they had, it proved the fact that they just crushed the Chinese uh, easily when they come, come, start coming through. But it also pointed out that they were going to run into real problems quickly uh, unless they changed their whole approach to logistics in fighting a different kind of enemy. So there was a there was an advance of knowledge just by simply playing this simple war game uh, uh, that we had done. Now, if that war game had been done by uh, analyst uh, six or eight months ago and played a game about what would happen if the Russians came into Ukraine, I think that they would probably have come up with at least a more nuanced answer, if not a different answer than the one they gave the president, which was just flat wrong.
Wow. Well, it um, looks like we're coming to the end of our time, but this has been fascinating. Um, I do need to point out the, the Garland County Library doesn't um, espouse or support any particular political opinion, but what we do love is books. And if you'd like to get a hold of this book, like I said at the beginning of the broadcast, it's going to be available um, as soon as it comes through processing, but you should be able to go onto our website now and put it on hold. Um, or if you, if you don't want to go online, you can call us at 501-623-4161 and, and ask about um, Carl Ford uh, and his book, Tilting at Windmills, My Tug of War Between Intelligence and Policy. And again, you can also find that on Amazon. And Mr. Ford, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been fascinating, and we have really enjoyed having you here. Uh, it was my pleasure. I like to talk about my book. Oh, it's just I, as I write to most people, I, I hope that they enjoy reading it half as much as I enjoyed living it. Uh, I was very fortunate. I lived uh, in good times and had great bosses. Uh, and I uh, very, very happy about how my career turned out. Uh, well, we are we are very glad that you've joined us tonight. Um, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Same to you.